here today. We're learning Rambam, Mishnah Torah. That's our kind of foundational jumping point as part of a longer term learning about Jewish law of war and the ethics of Jewish war and the ethics of, of fighting Jewishly. <clears throat> and learning this for the last five, six weeks, we've been laying a foundation for Rambam, understanding what he's teaching us and understanding this law that we're learning. We're laying a foundation. Because if we would go straight into, well, you're supposed to wipe out a Amalek without the foundation, we really, you end up with the International Court of Justice. They have no clue as to the fuller, they don't want to have a clue, but it's important for us to have a clue as to where those things come in and how we interpret them and understand them. Likewise, for that same reason, we were learning the power of the king, not merely in a political sense, gee, that's interesting how to run a country under Jewish law, but gaining an insight into the king's power, authority. So we have learned the king has authority to forcibly conscript people and to take their lands and certainly to take control of their lands in order to clear out the fields like an like a Fifth Amendment taking in order so that his armies can march through. So we've learned he has tremendous power, even to the point in learning the story of uh, King Ahav and Izebel, King Ahab and Jezebel and Navot uh, in Carmel, that he, the king wanted that vineyard and everything. We've seen the king has a lot of authority, but it has to be legit. He has to be using it with some measure of legitimacy. But in great measure, his authority even outweighs, quote unquote, legitimacy. And we even learned that the rabbis were afraid, recognizing the power of the king, particularly of the kings of the 10 tribes of the north, like King Yanai, who, if he didn't want to stand up in court, he would look at the judges and just say, who's going to make me? And nobody would until the point came that they said, you know, let's not even have kings come to court to testify because they have too much power. We can't can't control it. So we've been learning the background and understanding the authority that the Torah gives to the kings. And we understand that all the laws we're learning in the Torah, from which we're building further information, are predicated in the first instance on having a sort of a an autocracy where a king really can force people to do stuff and you don't have demonstrations in downtown tel aviv or whatever or the center of tel aviv against the government because they all get executed right away nothing to talk about so that's a whole different society and it's not even a question of whether we like it or don't like it it's judaism but only when there's a beta mcdash when the temple stands and, and these laws apply on that level now, what's happening today that we're getting to today's text, and this is important to understand because we're now in the text. We're beyond simply philosophy and theory and general background. We're in the text of Rambam. We did that last week and we're continuing. But what we're going to be learning today almost reads as though it's a segue. Like, I was just getting into this. I was just getting to laws of war. And suddenly today we're talking about the land of Israel, like Zionism or the land of Israel. So I've got to explain what's happening today, what we're going to get into, because it's going to, for one class tonight, seemingly take us off target. But it really is part of the target to which we'll be thoroughly returning next week. Let me explain. As you may recall from our earliest classes, we were explaining what Rambam's Mishnah Torah even is. He saw a need approximately a thousand years, 800 years after the Mishnah and Gemara were, were uh, redacted, were created as a document, so to speak, many volumes. Rambam saw there's all this Jewish law out there, but there's nothing practical for people to, to go to to look up a law. As a California attorney, I know that I could look at California law, the codes. That's an expression that lawyers use, will, will use to each other. 
Uh, you ask, you're allowed to do this? Well, the partner will say to the associate, don't take my time, go and look it up in the code. And if you know how to look it up and you know how to understand how the codes are constructed, you just look it up and there's the codes. And even for non-lawyers, you've heard of maybe penal code section, whatever. If you watch a movie, they're arrested, they're charged with violating penal code this or with a vehicle code that. So there are codes. Rambam felt Judaism needs a code. That is to say, there's all this discussion and rabbis and the Talmud is kind of like a, a stream of consciousness kind of discussion where they'll be talking about, I don't know, let's say the word of Shabbat, let's say, it'll be like the way I teach class sometimes where we're talking about a subject and then somehow I get onto a segue that really is related to the subject, but it, it kind of gets us off track. But I have a reason for it and I come back to the track. So you'll be learning the Gemara. I don't know. They'll be learning. Well, I'm making this up just to give it. They'll learn, they're making a law about Shabbos, let's say. And they say you're not supposed to make fire on Shabbat. And then maybe a rabbi gets into a segue about the about making fire. And truly, uh, in the middle of talking about the laws of Shabbat, suddenly the Masechet Shabbat, the Talmudic tractate on Shabbat, goes onto a segue. Well, while we're talking about lighting Shabbos candles, we're talking about candles, lighting candles. Let's uh, let's just segue and let's talk about Hanukkah for a little while and lighting a menorah. Literally, that's what happens in the Gemara. Something like uh, Daf Chafalaf, around, around Folio 21, um, where all of a sudden, like I'm, I'm really getting into this. What are the laws of Shabbos? What kind of wicks? In the old days, they didn't just have you buy a box of candles in the store or at Amazon. Uh, in the old days, you had to buy wicks and you had to buy oil let's say olive oil, other kinds of fuel, and you set up your candles, and the Gemara talks about, well, you would use these kinds of things are good to be used as wicks. These kind of things should not be used as wicks. These kinds of oils are appropriate. These kinds of oils are not appropriate. And in the middle of all that, they start talking about Hanukkah. Well, while we're on the subject, so lighting a menorah, and while we're talking about lighting a menorah, what my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? What, what is Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah is, you had uh, a fight with the Greeks, and then uh, they lit the candles and lasted it. And it just gets off into another place. Rambam felt, we need codes. We need like a compilation, a compendium, that pulls together in one place all the laws of Shabbat. And not Hanukkah. Even though they talk about Hanukkah in the context of Shabbat. Just Shabbat. So he pulls the laws of Shabbat from the Chumash and the laws of Shabbat from the Mishnah, Gemara, and he brings it together. What happens? To, what about Hanukkah? Yeah, Hanukkah too, but I'm going to put it somewhere else. I'm going to put it with the laws of Hanukkah. And since there's not a lot of laws to make a really big code, so it kind of puts it together with Purim also. But it's kind of like an organizing principle. So I like laws of Hanukkah and Purim, and, uh, and he puts it there. So you find Hanukkah talks about, talked about in the Gemara in the context of Shabbat, but Rambam puts it somewhere else because he wants Shabbat for Shabbat. Okay, so what have we been learning? Hilchot Malachim and Hilchot Melchama. We've been learning the laws of wars and kings. Now, he could have put the laws of kings with the laws of uh, Jerusalem, the laws of the Beit HaMikdash. Um, he could have put the laws somewhere else. He felt it's very pertinent to pull together laws that pertain to kings, their authority, their political authority, whom they can conscript, that they have to have a Torah with them at all times, how many wives they're allowed maximum to be married to, all the laws of kings. And of all the places to put it, he chose to put it together with the laws of war. Because you can't have war without kings. In his time, no one imagined prime ministers and elections. You have king. You can't have war without a king. We've been learning that. The king declares war, the king this, the king that, the king conscripts the soldiers, the king grabs the territory to march through, the king decides whether to go to an optional law to expand the territory uh, for imperialistic purposes. So Rambam's mind was that there are laws of war, there are laws of kings, and they go together. And I could put it together with something else, but this is where it seems to go together. Now, 
the Rambam also found in all the laws of the Mishnah, the Gemara, laws about the land of Israel. He could have put the laws of land of Israel very, very reasonably with the laws of Beit HaMikdash. The Beit HaMikdash is in Jerusalem. If Jews are not in the land of Israel, we're not going to have a temple. That's what we see the last 2,000 years. You have to have a land to have the temple. Even when you have the land, it's like since 1948, we still don't have a Beit HaMikdash. But for sure, you don't have the Beit HaMikdash without the land. He very, very easily could have organized those laws when he put them together, the laws of Eretz Israel. He could have put them together with the laws of the Beit HaMikdash. Or he could have put the laws of the land of Israel together with the laws of agricultural laws like Shemitah, the seventh year of produce that only applies to vegetables and fruit that grow in Israel. Uh, things that grow in the United States, for example, they are not impacted by Shemitah, even in the seventh year. If you have tomatoes, I don't know. You have things that grow in America. You don't have to worry about was what about Shemitah. And it doesn't matter. It wasn't grown in the Holy Land. Only land of Israel produce has Shemitah laws. So he very well could have said, if there are laws particularly pertaining to Israel, other than agriculture, I'm going to put them together with Shemitah, with produce laws. Or as I said a moment ago, with the Beit HaMikdash laws, the laws of sacrifices. Well, what's the job the Kohen offers sacrifices? How do you sacrifice the animal? What animals do you bring? What kind of sacrifices are there? What time of day? What the, the, he could have brought that together with the land of Israel. Of all the places Rambam, in his reasonable, rational, orderly mind, seeking to create a code where everything is in its proper place, topically, not stream of conscience, he decided to put the laws of the land of Israel with the laws of war. Even the laws tonight that we're learning that have nothing to do with war per se. But he saw them as the natural place to park. The natural parking lot in the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam's Yad HaZakah, the natural place to park the laws of Eretz Yisrael was with the laws of war. Why? So he doesn't say it. I want to share it with you because we're going to learn. And it's like, what's it doing here? Israel, for Jews and Judaism, is not allowed to give up Israel. You have to go to war for Israel. And in a war, you're not allowed to give up any part of Israel. You're not allowed to negotiate a peace that, as part of that a peace agreement, includes giving up part of Israel. I'm not getting into politics now, whether it's a good idea to give up Arab terrorists in return for hostages and how many to give up. And that's for the politicians. I do have my own personal opinions, but not for my class, not for, not for a shul class. For an article I'll write later, but not for a shul class. That's politics. Politics, how many, how much money should we give up? Should we agree to stop fighting in order to get terrorists back, uh, to, to get prisoners back? But to give up the land of Israel, that's forbidden. Let's say that would be the only sticking point to a terrorist hostage deal, that they want us to give up this or that. You're not allowed to give up land of Israel. And therefore, in the laws of war, you have laws pertaining to loving Israel, even though those laws that we're going to learn tonight, no, no, let's get to the laws already. The, the laws that we're going to learn tonight don't even say anything about whether you can give up the land of Israel. It goes without saying, literally. You're not allowed to give up the land of Israel. Ah. So there's one more background halachic structure here before we get into that, because it's important to know it and understand it. There's a great debate among the greatest of rabbis in the modern era. Okay, we understand you're not allowed to give up land of Israel. You're also not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur. But to save a life, you're allowed to eat on Yom Kippur. You have to consult with a rabbi. You're not supposed to make the decision on your own. You have to consult with your rabbi. But if somebody, under certain circumstances, the doctors, whatever, the rabbi consults, and this person, this Yom Kippur must must eat something or whatever, there's room to, for that person to eat on Yom Kippur. You're not allowed to drive a car in Shabbat. But if it's going to save a life, you drive a car in Shabbat. The, your, the wife goes into labor 
on Saturday morning. And you're not allowed to just say, well, I'm not supposed to drive on Shabbat, so we'll have to hope she'll give birth at home and we'll have to hope she doesn't die. No, you have to get right into the car and drive to the hospital. In other words, you're not allowed to drive in Shabbat, but to save a life, you drive in Shabbat. Not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur, but to save a life, you eat on Yom Kippur. Uh, and the Jews living under Tsar in Tsarist Russia for centuries, they would draft young men, and those young men would be drafted not for two or three years, like during the time of conscription in the United States or in Israel today. They'd be, they'd be drafted for 15 years, 25 years. Imagine a 18-year-old boy, and he gets drafted by the Tsar. He's not coming home till he's 33. That's like half his life, practically, a third, a third of his life. Now, from age 18 to 33, he's going to be in the Tsar's army. And they don't serve kosher food. They serve pork. It's available. It's cheaper than, let's say, beef. So the question, it truly arose many times. Rabbi, I'm in the army. I'm going to starve to death unless I eat pork. What do I do? And in the very, very famous answer of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, he answered, if the only way to stay alive is to eat pork, then eat the pork, but don't suck the bones. Don't enjoy it. Just have what you have to have. And so we have three examples. I just shared. I could keep going on. I don't want to because of time. But three examples where you're not allowed to do something, but to save a life, you're allowed. Not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur, but to save a life, you're allowed. Not allowed to drive on Shabbat, but to save a life, you're allowed. Not allowed to eat pork, but to save a life, you're allowed. So we come back now to the great rabbinic debate of the modern era. Okay, you're not allowed to give up an inch of Eretz Israel, a centimeter, but to save lives. What about if the Arabs are at war and you could make a peace deal? The Oslo Accords of 1993, other such peace deals. Ariel Sharon deciding in 2005 to give up Gaza, Ehud Barak deciding to give up southern Lebanon uh, for peace. So, well, we just said that to save a life, you can, even something you're not allowed to do, you're, you do it to save a life. So perhaps to save a life, you should be able to give up Eretz Israel. So there are two opinions. And again, these opinions by the greatest of the scholars and rabbinic authorities of the modern era. One opinion has been, yeah, to save a life, to save lives, you are allowed to give up part of Israel temporarily and see what God has in mind for the future, has planned for the future. That's one opinion. That opinion is that we follow the Yom Kippur model. How do we decide on Yom Kippur whether you're allowed to eat to save a life? A rabbi is not a doctor. So the halacha is the rabbi needs to consult with a doctor. A doctor is capable, if he's a good doctor, of conveying to the rabbi, does this person need to eat to save a life? A rabbi has to understand he does not have his own knowledge base making him qualified in many cases. Sometimes it's obvious. But in certain cases, like in my own career, sometimes it's obvious. Usually, I will have to consult with a doctor, with that person's doctor, to find out what's the big picture. I have had cases where doctors tell me, here's the story, and therefore, either doctor recommend he eat. And after I get off the phone, having heard what the doctor said, the halacha is that person's not going to eat. Because the doctor, doesn't, the doctor doesn't know what he doesn't know, or she doesn't know. So for a doctor to just say, I'm Jewish, a doctor who doesn't observe the Torah, I'm Jewish, the guy's got a stomach ache, he shouldn't eat this Yom Kippur. So as a rabbi, I've got to interpret the facts and data that the doctor gives me and understand whether what, what the halacha is. But on the other hand, if a guy tells me he's got a stomach problem, I can't simply say, well, that doesn't mean, I don't know what's going on in his stomach. Maybe he's got an iguana, uh, what's it called, an iguana, iguana uh, hernia, I don't know. So... You got you to gotta have that kind of consulting. So the rabbis who permit giving up land of Israel in return for peace, if it'll save life, applying the Yom Kippur principle say, just as only an expert can make that decision for Yom Kippur, namely a doctor, in the same way only military generals, 
they must be consulted. The rabbi must consult. A military general, an expert in war, to determine whether this is a situation where giving up land of Israel will save life. And the rabbis are very emphatic. The ones who say it could be possible to give up some of the land of Israel are very emphatic. You may not rely on the opinion of a former general who now is a politician because you can't trust politicians. Now, the rabbis, these kinds of rabbis are very elegant in the way they say things, and they're not going to say because politicians are liars. So you have to know how to read between the lines. But their point is, when a former general, now a politician, tells you they should give up land for peace, you don't know how much of that is military strategy and how much of that is a former military expert now an incompetent diplomat negotiating foolishly and making foolish political decisions based on considerations that a military general would never agree to. So you have to ask real generals in the field. In today's application, you would not ask the defense minister of Israel. If you follow the rabbinic authority and assuming Israel even would follow rabbinic authority because the modern state is not run according to halakha per se. You would not consult with the defense minister of Israel or the prime minister, but with the chief of staff of the military. And what I have noticed in all my 30 years of learning this stuff, I cannot remember a single time in 30 years plus that the actual serving active generals said Israel should agree to give up territory to save lives. I can't remember one single time, every single time Israel has given up land in these deals with the Arabs that always backfire. They have done so based on these advice of generals who became politicians. Ehud Barak, he said, let's leave southern Lebanon. It'll save lives. Instead, Nasrallah came in with Hezbollah. It's cost lives. Ariel Sharon, he was known as the bulldozer. He wouldn't give up an inch. Tilly became prime minister and said, let's walk out of Gaza. It'll save lives. And if you come to our Sunday class for the last 17 weeks, you know how that worked out. And then Yitzchak Rabin, whom I refer to as St. Isaac, uh, because he really was a bad guy. But they tur the left turned him into a saint because he was assassinated. And you can't do that. And so they try to turn him into an Abraham Lincoln, um, St. Isaac. So he came up with the idea of giving Arafat his own country, uh, giving Arafat the so-called Palestine Authority, the Oslo Accords, where he gave Arafat control over newspapers, television, radio. He decided that to increase peace, we we're going to give Arafat rifles and guns so we can have a police force that can enforce the law. And of course, what ended up happening is all the rifles and guns were used against Jews by a police force that kills Jews. And he used his weapons of mass communication like television, radio, and newspapers to educate the entire Arab population of Judea Samaria to hate Jews and want to kill Jews. So Rabin had been a general, and he never gave up territory, never would have agreed to give up territory when he was an active general. Became a politician, suddenly he's giving up land. So that's one of the two sides of the coin. Those rabbis who would say, like Harav Chacham Ovadi Yosef said that if it would save lives, you could give up territory. But you have to consult generals, not politicians, which in effect means you don't give up land because no general ever says give up land, only when they become politicians. And we see now in, 19, in, in, now in the year 2024, 5784, how all those different peace deals ended up working out. Got no peace from anything in 75 years of these. Okay. But as I've said, there's another opinion, which is the majority opinion. And the majority opinion is, even to save lives, you're not allowed to give up land of Israel. Never allowed to give up an inch. What about saving lives? You can do it on Yom Kippur. You can save lives for Kashrus. How can you not say? And the answer is, in that school of thought, you can't have a country. The definition of having a country is people dying to protect the country. 
as pacifist as your country might be, and as much as it may be national policy, never to go to war, you cannot have a country. It's different from Yom Kippur or from eating pork uh, or driving on Shabbat. The very mitzvah of having a country, you can't avoid from time to time. Needing an army of people will, will include people who get killed protecting the country. And we just have to look without getting into the politics too much, because you got to get some text in here. But think of America. Okay, we did not have to lose all those young boys during the Civil War if we could have worked it out. Fine. And maybe we didn't have to, maybe one time we had to lose boys to have independence in 1776. Okay. In 1812, we had to hold on to what we got in 1776. Okay. And let's say we could have stayed out of World War I. Okay. So, Rabbi, couldn't we have an America without really having had to fight if we would have really stuck to a pacifist? Well, by 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, what are you going to do? You have no choice. You have to fight. You could be pacifist. You have no fight. You have no choice. They're bombing you. They're killing everybody. If you don't fight back, they're going to take Hawaii. You still don't fight back, they'll take California. You still don't fight back, they'll take Nevada, Arizona, and the Ninth Circuit. And eventually they'll get to New York. At some point, you have to fight back. What happened to, in 9-11? So no one was looking for a fight that day when they woke up in the morning. And then bin Laden took down the two towers. You got to do something. If you don't do something, next thing you know, they're taking down more towers. And you have no choice. Every country runs into this. One more example, Belgium. Belgium was known as a national policy. Belgium maintained neutrality at the time of World War I, the early 1900s. Germany decided they wanted to attack and conquer France. It's just, they had no great reason. Germany and France, 100 years ago, that's what they did. Arabs weren't a problem in those days. Communists weren't a problem. So the Germans, they woke up every morning, let's kill some French people. And that's what went on. That's how World War I started. And so Germany decided, it was 1914, the Soviet, the communist revolution was three years later, 1917, no problems with communists. Arabs still didn't have any of their own countries. And so Germany decided, it's 1914, let's conquer France. In order to get from Germany to France, they had to go through Belgium. They had no other way. They don't share a common border. So in order to get to France, they had to go to Belgium. Belgium, however, was like Switzerland, neutral. And it was understood worldwide, you're not allowed to invade Belgian territory because they're neutral. And Germany had to decide if we march into Belgium, which is the only way we can get into France, then England is going to attack us. Not so much that they want to defend the French, but they will see if we don't respect the neutrality of Belgium, they're going to assume that nothing is going to stop us. And after we take France, we'll cross the, uh, the English Channel and go to in and attack England. So then England got involved. And that's how World War I started. So England got involved to defend France. Then Germany's allies came in for Germany. Russia had their own reason for getting involved with England and France. And you had a world war. My point in that is Belgium. This was a country that decided we're not going to go to war. We're not taking sides between France and Germany. Not a problem. Oh, yes, it is. If you want to have Belgium, sooner or later, you're going to have people getting killed. And a lot of Belgians got killed. because. That's what it is to have war, to have a land. And so coming back to the rabbinic opinion on giving up parts of Israel for peace, the side that says under no circumstance can you ever give up a land of Israel, the idea is if you want to have an Israel, you have to have people die. No matter how peaceful you are, no matter how much you wave the flags to the Arabs, all we want is a small part of the world to have a Jewish country. Sooner or later, Arabs will try to kill you. And that's just the way it goes. So with that as background, understanding that to have the land of Israel, either you're not allowed to give up an inch, a centimeter, 
because that's what happens when you have a country. Or you would be allowed to give it up to save lives, but only if actively serving military generals tell you, which for all intents and purposes typically means you can't give up anything. This brings us to Perakhei, chapter 5 of Hilchot Malachim, the laws of kings, and why suddenly, amid discussions of the king's authority to conduct war, we get into the land of Israel. Why Rambam has put all the laws of Israel, or the, or the, love, the laws of loving Israel, and her primacy in the middle of the laws of war is for the reason I explained tonight. And we're going to see that Israel for a Jew, there's absolutely nothing like Israel. We're not talking politics. We're not talking, quote unquote, secular nationalism, but halacha. Here we go. And again, I, I, I had to do this uh, extended introduction to make sense of what we're about to learn here. Okay, here we go. Let's find the Rambam. So we had learned last class that, you're, that you have a positive commandment to wipe out the seven nations. And we talked about that. The seven nations of Canaan, the Chivi, the Yavusi, the Girgashi, the Prizi, they're no longer around. And you have to wipe out Amalek. And we went through that last week also in great detail. Even brought up the clips from the International Court of Justice. We talked about the whole deal. Okay, we continue. And then we talked about that the king has authority to make war. Certain wars are commanded, that there are obligatory, obligatory laws. And then after all those laws have been taken, after all those uh, lands have been taken, the military mitzvah wars, then there are optional wars. Mohammed Rashut, if it's approved by the Sanhedrin, the consultation with all the judges, and we talked about all that. Okay. And what seems now like a segue instead continues the laws of war premised on what I was just teaching you. Let's do it. A Jew may live anywhere in the world except Egypt. Jews are not allowed to live in Egypt. There's going to be more to it. It's a whole paragraph. So there's more to it. But in the first instance, Jews are not allowed to live in Egypt. You're allowed to live in America, Australia, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Morocco, Yemen, Obviously, it's up to the local countries. They may not let you in. But if they do, you could live there. But there's something, just as there's something uniquely positive about the land of Israel, there is something uniquely forbidden about the land of Egypt that is different from other Arab countries like Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, etc. Min hayam hagadol. You are not allowed to live anywhere in Egypt. And he then describes geographically the boundaries, uh, approximate distance of how big is that forbidden territory? And it's 400 parsa by 400 parsa. I'm not going to get into uh, figuring out how many square inches or miles that comes to. It's for, for our purposes, it's pretty much um, perhaps even as far as uh, from Ethiopia or whatever Eretz Kush is, different opinions on that, not going to get into it, uh, up to the desert. Hakol Asur Lidyashevba, it is all of it is forbidden to dwell in it. Now, what does that mean to dwell in it? Let Yashev, Yeshuv. You're not allowed to settle in it. So in other words, maybe you're allowed to visit on a vacation, see the pyramids. Maybe you're allowed to take a visiting professorship for a year at the University of Cairo, let's say, if there is such a thing. So maybe you're allowed to go for a year. Maybe you're allowed to go for a vacation. In a five-star Hilton if there is one in, in Egypt, maybe you're allowed to go to Egypt 
and do business. We'll find out. But you're not allowed to do like, uh, let's say someone decides, you know, we have had it here in in France with all the Arab anti-Semitism, Muslim anti-Semitism that has come to France and we're moving to Canada. And we're going to stay in Canada. So that would be allowed. But to move to Egypt, that would not be allowed. Rambam adds, there are three separate places in the Torah where we are commanded never again to return to Egypt. Shnemar, as it says, first of all, in Devarim, Deuteronomy 17.16. 17.16. This is actually in the context of God commanding laws of the kings. We actually learned this, but I don't expect you remembered it because it was in a different introductory context. A king, lo yarbelo susim, is not allowed to have more than a certain amount of horses. Velo yashiva ta'a mitzrayma. And the king of Israel is not allowed to bring the Jews back to Egypt. Laman harbot sus. In order to go and retrieve more horses. Vahashem amar lachem. Torah says, chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, that God said, Lo tosifun lashuv badar chazaod. You may not ever again go on that road, on that direction. You must not go back that way again. So that's one of three places. In other words, we were in Egypt as slaves, and we went out, and we may not go back on that road back. And that's only one out of three places, that the king may not take the people back, even for the sole purpose of getting more horses. Furthermore, it says in Shemot, the book of Exodus, at the time of the splitting of the Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds, Kriyat Yamsuf, Lotosif Odler Ota. Never again may you see it. Chapter 14, verse 13. Vayomer Moshe El Ha'am Al Tirau. The Jews at this moment have their back to the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea. And they don't know what to do. And Moshe says, don't worry. God is going to take care of this. You're going to see a miracle the likes of which never has happened in history. He doesn't even tell them the sea is going to split. Can't even describe it yet. It's happening soon. Tells them, don't fear. Rather, just stand here and watch how God will save you, the salvation of God. Assure you, Asalachemayom, that he will do for you today. Ki Asheri Itemet Mitzrayamayom, because as you're looking at those Egyptian chariots bearing down on you, about to slaughter all of you, you think, understand that the Egypt that you're looking at today, Loto Sifulirotam Odolam, you will Adolam, you will never again see such an Egypt. The Egypt you see today, you will never again see them. Rambam cites that. In other words, what, what Moshe literally was telling them is that that army of Egyptians you're looking at, the world's strongest army, pretty soon, in another verse or two or three or four, they're all going to be gone. The entire Egyptian army will drown in the Sea of Reeds. And they'll be gone from basically history. They will never again be a world power and empire as they are at this moment. So Rambam cites two verses. The king's not allowed to bring you back to Egypt. You're not allowed to go back on that road. And you will not again see them. And then finally, he cites a third verse, that's the one I just read you, and the one I did not read you was 2868. Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. And that's the one that most applies post-biblical, post-biblically. Here in the Tochacha, where Moshe warns the people, if you violate God's law, the punishment will be swift and brutal, God forbid. And nations will come and drive you from the land. 
and you will be forcibly taken to Egypt on ships and exiled from your land. You will actually, Moshe says, if God forbid the nation sins so terribly that God implements this tochacha, this warning I'm giving you now, what will happen is the enemy will come on ships, on boats, and they will force you on their boats, and they will take you out of Israel into Egypt against your will on the path that I told you, you never would go again to see it. You'll be taken there. Citing these three psukim, Rambam says it is forbidden for Jews to live in Egypt, but Alexandria and Alexandria, Bechlal HaYisur, there was a, at the time of Rambam, and at other times, there were huge Jewish populations in Alexandria. So you might think that's an exception. Like, let's say, just to give an example, not to be silly, let's say this all were given a, hundred, a thousand years later. And let's say there were a law, you're not allowed to live anywhere outside of Israel, even in America. And it would be like Rambam adding, even in Borough Park, Brooklyn, even in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, the center of the Lubavitch. That's why I saying like even in Alexandria, not only that you shouldn't be living in Idaho and you shouldn't be living in uh, West Virginia, uh, where there are very few Jews. You shouldn't even be living in Crown Heights. Now, that's not what the halacha says, or, but that's what he means when he says you shouldn't be living even in Alexandria. So, turns out, there's something, first of all, before we get into Israel, turns out there's something about e Egypt. Egypt in particular, a Jew is not allowed to be in Egypt, number one. And then number two, he continues. Okay, so you're not allowed to live there. You are, however, allowed temporarily to go to Egypt to engage in business for commercial business needs. Person needs to make a living. And let's say you can make a living in Egypt. Uh, Denise and I, I'm, I, 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 I'm thinking, for example, uh, Avi from Avi and Naomi. So we had a young guy about 20, 25 years old named Avi, a regular member of our shul. Since then, he and Naomi made Aliyah. And if they're watching on YouTube, hi, Avi and Naomi. And Avi, every month or two, would tell us, I won't be, we used to have a Friday night Shabbat group that every Friday night, 15 or so people would join us Rebbe Tzanel and Zechron Levracha and I for Shabbat dinner and Zemira. And uh, every month or so, Avi would tell us, I'll be gone the next two weeks. Naomi will be here, but I'll be gone. I've got to go to China. And like, what's going in China? And he bought and sold trinkets in China. And he made a, he made a good living from it. Uh, whatever it is, he would buy junk out of China and he would make money. And then he'd go back and buy more junk from China. So, and I'm, I'm saying junk, maybe it was good quality. I don't know. I had the impression, I had the impression we're talking, we're not talking about Lennox, China. Okay. Um, and so what happened is he would go. So that's how he made a Parnassa. For most people, you make a Parnassa and income closer to home. But he happened to find living in Orange County that his income came from going to China. So let's say a Jew could make his income, but his income, for whatever the reason, he has to go to Egypt once a month. So Rambam is saying, even though you're not allowed to go back again, not allowed to see them again, if it's for business to make a living, you're allowed to go back for that. Furthermore, you're allowed to go to Egypt if your purpose is to make war against a different country on the other side of Egypt. Just as Germany was going to attack France and there was no way to do it except through going through Belgium. So if your real purpose is to attack Libya, and there's no way to get to Libya except by going through Egypt, Rambam is saying temporarily, if you're just going through to get to a different objective, that would not violate Torah law. Thirdly, what if you actually go to live there? 
which you're not supposed to. The ban, the prohibition, is to live there permanently, to settle there. If your intent is to just take a one-year visiting professorship in Cairo or Alexandria, that would be okay. But so we're now finding out you're not allowed to live in Egypt, but you're allowed to do business there. You're allowed to go through it in order to conquer other lands on the other side. And you're even allowed to go and live there if it's only temporary. And then Rambam adds something very interesting. He says, what if you go to live there, intending to live there permanently? In biblical times, when you violate a forbidden law, they would whip you. There'd be lashes, malkos, or makos, lokin. He says, ain lokin alavza. The ban, the prohibition to live in Egypt, if you consciously move to Egypt to live there, you don't get whipped for it by a basin, by a court of law, a Jewish court of law. You don't get, in other words, it's not an enforceable violation. It's a prohibition. It's a Torah prohibition, but it's not enforceable, kind of like jaywalking. Why? Because your intent is to live there permanently, but we don't punish based on intent. We punish based only on action. When you get up and move buy a house in Egypt, intending to be there permanently, that's only your intent to be. You bought the house, but the house buying is not the ban. The ban is living there permanently and every day. If you're alive the next day, then you weren't there permanently. You merely intended to be there forever. But maybe something would change a week later, a month later, a year later. Maybe crime, you, you moved there because you thought it would be nice, turned out to have crime, turned out you thought it was going to be a nice neighborhood. It's not a nice neighborhood. Uh, thought they were nice to Jews, they're not nice to Jews. Because when you first enter, that's allowed. You're only thinking. And if in your mind you're thinking, I'm going there permanently, that's only what you're thinking. But you haven't done it. The only time we'll know that you were there permanently is if on the day you died, you're still there. And how do we know that you weren't thinking that day that tomorrow, if you're alive, you plan to go back? So we cannot enforce the ban. Vieira Eli, and then Rambam adds, interesting, because there's something I haven't mentioned till this moment. Some of you may know, most of you probably don't. Rambam lived in Egypt. So he's a truthful, the best. He's a truthful reporter of Jewish law. But he lived in Egypt. And I just taught you everything I just taught you. Now, it's one thing to say that the local reform rabbi said, you're not supposed to do X, Y, Z, but he does it. That's good. That's because he's a reform rabbi. But Rambam, we're talking about the Rambam. No one's going to be studying that reform rabbi in 2000, a thousand years after he's gone. I don't know that they're going to be studying what I teach. But there's the Rambam. So how do we understand that? The Rambam started off in Spain. His family were part of the great Jewish community of Spain. And then they were exiled through the terrible, terrible murders, pogroms or crusade, whatever you want to call it, they had to leave Spain. And for a period of time, the only safe place in the world to live was Egypt. Life, life, life works that way. Hey, let me tell you, in the 1600s, the only safe place for Jews to live was Poland. When you think of Auschwitz, when you think of Poland, a lot of Jewish people think of Poland. They think, boy, that was a tough place. That was the best place in the world for Jews. That's how we got there. It wasn't like, a, like horror movies, you know, Hollywood's horror movies, where the dumb kids, the dumb 20-year-olds go towards the death, towards the monster. To hear the noise of the monster, instead of going the other direction, to go closer to see what the noise is. Jews don't go out of their way to just walk into that. That was a safe place. 
So Rambam goes further, explaining to us without fully, he's explaining, so how did he end up there? So he says, he says, let's go back. Okay. Okay. And it seems to me, First of all, he says, it seems to me, if a king of Israel approaches a Beitin, a 71 uh, uh, judge Sanhedrin, and asks for a Mohammed Rashut, an optional war to conquer Egypt, if the Beitin of 71 judges said, you may, it seems to me, he says, that would be allowed. Because the Beitin said so. Below his hira, elala shuvla yechidim, and the Torah ban prohibiting Jews from going back to Egypt refers only to individuals. It applies to you and to you and to you and to me. But it doesn't apply, let's say, to a Jewish nation that is fleeing as a nation a horrible persecution, trying to get out of I don't know Germany, whatever. Uh, at the time of, of Hitler. So individuals may not on their own accord, this, of their own accord, decide, our family, let's move to Egypt. He said, for individuals, you should not go to Egypt because Egypt is a place where there is an unusual amount of perversion, moral perversion. And it applies particularly to Egypt because the Torah says, the Torah says in chapter 18 of Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, you shall not copy the practices of the land of Egypt where you dwell, or the land of Canaan to which I'm taking you, nor shall you follow their ways. Rather, my rules shall you observe and faithfully observe my laws but not their ways, because their ways are perverted ways. Okay. We continue. Asur latzeit me eretz Yisrael l'chutz la'aretz li'olam. Very interesting problem here. And halacha. Continuing. Till now we've been talking about the one country in the world you're not allowed to go to. And now we get to Israel. And that's why I did the whole big buildup in the beginning of today's class. Because again, what does this all have to do with the laws of war? Because of the centrality of Israel to Jewish life. And by the way, that's why when someone says nowadays, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm only anti-Zionist. If you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. Because Zionism is part of Judaism. It's like saying, I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm only anti-kosher. If you're against people eating kosher, if you make a law, in this country, no one's allowed to eat kosher. No one is allowed to put in a certification that food is kosher. We're not anti-Semitic. We're just anti-kosher. Then you're anti-Semitic. Because it's, it's cooked into and baked into Judaism to eat kosher. And it's baked into Judaism, the land of Israel. How much so? A person who lives in Israel is not allowed to leave Israel, ever. Whoa. But we meet Israelis who live in America. All right, so it's a question. And then there's a question, are you allowed to leave Israel? Let's say that's one question. And then there's another question that even if that's forbidden, can you just leave Israel and go on vacation? let's say in America for two weeks. So that's a question. A lot of people say to leave Israel temporarily to go on vacation, that's okay, but you're not allowed to resettle outside of Israel. People ask, why did some of the greatest rabbis of the modern era, given what we're learning now and what we're going to keep learning today and next week, how is it that some of the greatest rabbis of the modern era never lived in Israel? The Lubavitcher Rebbe. Lubavitcher Rebbe, the, the Chabad. 
Lubavitcher Rebbe, one of the greatest rabbis of the generation. He never lived in Israel. His followers lived in Israel. He stayed in Brooklyn. How do we explain Rav Moshe Feinstein? The greatest Ashkenazic, uh, Litv Litv Litvish uh, of the Lithuanian school of Torah law. He never lived in Israel. How do we understand that some of the greatest rabbis of the modern Israel, of the modern era never lived in Israel? And the answer is, they believed if they ever set foot in Israel, they may never leave. Not that it's prison, but that that's the halakha. Once you go, any Jew living in Israel may not leave Israel. And they believed you don't even leave to take a two-week vacation at the New York Hilton. And therefore, because they had certain uh, missions to, to achieve in their, I don't want to use quite the word ministry, but it's the best English word for it, in their abundance, because that is what they had to do. Uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein was based in Manhattan. He primarily spoke Yiddish. He knew Hebrew, but Yiddish was his first language. He, he had built yeshivas. He had tens of thousands of students and just about the whole rabbinate, modern Orthodox as well, of his era of the 60s and 70s, looked to him for guidance. He felt he was needed there. Lubavitcher Rebbe, we see how his impact has been felt all over the world. He felt he had to do it from there, from Brooklyn, from Crown Heights. But that's part of the reason, that's the primary reason, some of those great rabbis never lived in Israel, even for a brief visit. Because because you are forbidden to leave Israel for outside Israel forever. And then there are just a few exceptions. Just as we learned before, you're not allowed to live in Egypt, but there are exceptions. As with all rules, there are exceptions. Not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur? Exception. Not allowed to drive on Shabbat? Exception. So what's the exceptions here? First of all, Lil Mo Torah. Let's say as many yeshivas as exist in Israel and as many brilliant and, and, and extraordinary rabbis as exist in Israel, a person feels he personally can learn Torah better outside Israel, then he's allowed to leave Israel to learn Torah better, to devote his life more to Torah. Now, how could that be? How can it possibly be? You're living in Jerusalem. And there's a gazillion shuls and yeshivas. How could it possibly be that you're going to learn Torah better in America or in France or whatever? And the answer is that certain people develop relationships with their rabbi. And they, they develop a study protocol by which the way their rabbi teaches, it connects with them. And they can learn with that rabbi, whether it's inspiration, whether it's his knowledge base, whether it's, you know, his je ne sais quoi, uh, who knows what it is. But there's something about that rabbi that they connect with. I had a particular Rav, Rav Dardek, who, uh, when I was in Yeshiva High School, and he connected also uh, with a rabbi of Victor Miller. Now, in certain areas, Rabbi Victor Miller would have looked at me, would look at me, and Zichron Levracha, and would say, what a, boy, this guy came out. I, I hope this guy doesn't tell people he's my student because he really didn't come out so good. Um, I may not have come out the way he would have wanted, but he spoke to me. And to this day, I learned his books and he spoke to me. He's unique. And uh, his worldview, you don't wear jeans, you don't wear a leather jacket. You wear a black hat and a white shirt and a black suit. And I wear a leather jacket and jeans. So um, I didn't come out quite the way he would want, but boy, does he talk to me. His writings, his teaching is Rabbi Victor Mill. So, so much so that when I was a teenager, my mom, my father died when I was 14, had leukemia. My mom, I lived with my mom's home till college. When I was about 14 or 15, we lived about a one hour walk from Rabbi Victor Miller Shul. Every Shabbos afternoon, I'd walk an hour to the youngest reel of rugby 
literally on the other side of the tracks. There were these railroad tracks on Forster Avenue in Brooklyn. And we were on one side of the tracks and East Flatbush was on the other side of the tracks. And uh, I'd walk an hour and his shul was not too far from my grandparents, my maternal grandparents. So my Zaidi and my uncle Yaakov used to daven at Rabbi Miller's shul for Shabbos Mincha. They daven somewhere else Shabbos morning. So every Shabbos afternoon, I'd walk to Rabbi Miller. He gave an amazing sheer 45 minute class before Mincha every Shabbos. And then uh, after Shabbos, I would stay for Mincha Marav. And then afterwards, uh, Uncle Yaakov would drive me home. And that was, I did that for like three, four years. Now, why did I do that? Of course, I loved seeing Uncle Yaakov and my grandfather, and that was very, and Bubby, and that was important to me. But the real reason, and they knew it as well, I went to hear Rabbi Miller. There were probably 10 rabbis on the way that I passed those shuls to get to Rabbi Miller. But there was something about learning and hearing Rabbi Miller. And for those who were affected by Rabbi Miller, I mean, to this day, many years after he passed away, his videos and his books and his, I still get a daily email of the teachings of Rabbi Miller. His followers, literally, they send out a daily email uh, where they take some modern current event and they draw something from something he wrote or said in some sermon that comments on a modern day event. It's just uncanny. He spoke about everything, whatever it might be. And so uh, in the same way, let's say someone in Israel has a Rebbe and they connect with that rabbi like I connected with Rabbi Miller. And then that Rebbe explains, for whatever the reason, he's going to America. We just learned you're not supposed to leave Israel to go to America. Let's say that Rebbe is going for a year to learn Torah and, and be at a yeshiva as a visiting Rebbe. Or, or let's say that Rebbe is someone who does not hold that you're not allowed to leave. There obviously are many rabbis who've been in Israel and have come to America. Uh, we were just talking uh, like at the Westwood Village uh, congregation. Uh, they had a wonderful rabbi from Israel who came to Westwood Village, California, and was a rabbi there. And only recently, after the October 7 war started, he felt his call was to go back to Israel. He had to go back. But he was in Israel. And, uh, and there are others. There are many like that. And so let's say the rabbi leaves Israel to teach for a while. Rambam is saying, bringing the Gemara, you're allowed to leave Israel to follow your Rebbe or something like that if you'll be able to learn Torah better. We're going to wrap up now the last uh, three, four minutes. So one exception, you're allowed to leave the land of Israel if you will learn Torah more intensely uh, and deeper. But, it, but it's not like got to be, it's not just theoretical. It's not just you're looking for an excuse to leave Israel and make money in America. So you say, I'm going to go to learn Torah. And you stop off for two days at yeshiva and goodbye yeshiva. It's got to be like what I described. O Lisa Isha, or to get married. Let's say you live in Israel and someone has a shidduch for you. Again, let's say America, uh, France, I don't know, Argentina. So what, there are no women to marry in Israel? Of course there are. But we even know you don't even have to be Jewish to know that there are people that get married to people that come from places outside where they live. They, they start dating, right? They go on the dating apps. And next thing you know, um, like I knew a guy local who ends up going out with somebody from Oakland. He met her on a dating app. And the parents weren't thrilled about it at all. And the attitude was, there's no Jewish girls in California. We're in Los Angeles. There's no Jewish girls here. He's got to find someone from Oakland. And, uh, but you know, I mean, a lot of us are married to people who come from other places. And then a lot of us are married to people who are local. Depends on, on the circumstances. But if a person finds that the right shidduch is outside Israel and he's Israel, he's in Israel, is allowed to leave Israel to marry someone outside of Israel. And this is the Rambam case. Or to save yourself, let's say, from, from anti Semites, from non Jewish anti Semites. Now, okay, in Rambam's case, it wasn't per se that he was leaving Israel to save himself from anti-Semites. He's leaving Spain. And then he adds, so those are three exceptions. 
when you're allowed to leave Israel to learn Torah, to marry, or to save your skin from anti-Semites, the Yachzer Laaretz, and then as soon as possible, you should return to Israel. So you marry the lady in France, and as soon as you can, you go back to Israel with her. You go to the yeshiva, you follow your Rebbe to Brooklyn, and as soon as possible, you come back to Israel. Furthermore, v'chein yotzehu l'schorah, you're also permitted to leave Israel if you need to to make a living for income. And unfortunately, from time to time, we encounter people in the modern era as well, including Orthodox people who really are very punctilious about uh, observing Torah law, and they leave Israel to come, let's say, to America to make a living. And what's that about? Because uh, they couldn't quite make it work in Israel. And they found a way to make it work in America, let's say, or in France or in Argentina, whatever. On the other hand, simply to decide you're going to get up from Israel, not for learning Torah, getting married, avoiding anti-Semitism, making a living. You just decided, looks like pretty exciting to live in America. That's where the, that's where the action is. That's forbidden. Ela in Kain Chazak Sham Hara'av. And we'll stop at this, unless it's gotten to the point that there's a famine in Israel. As we know, biblically, there was a period when Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham, had to leave the land of Israel because of famine. Yaakov encountered famine. God did tell Yitzchak uniquely of our three patriarchs when a famine hit Israel. God told Yitzchak not to leave Israel. So Yitzchak remained in the Gaza Strip because the Gaza Strip is part of Israel. And he said, don't leave Israel. Yitzchak is the only one of the three who never set foot outside of Israel. Um, if there's a famine, one may leave. But central to Judaism is living in Israel. Next week, we'll finish this particular quote-unquote segue. And we won't do that big, long introduction because I just did. That Israel is that central that therefore you're not allowed to give up even when you go to war. As we're seeing right now, this moment as we talk, you've got people like Britain's foreign minister, David Cameron, and Anthony Blinken and Biden, and all these people saying, you know, Israel should a two-state solution, and it could be peace, and they, you're not allowed to give up, you're not allowed to give up Judea Samaria. And I want to let you go now because we're at that time. We'll continue, but this is why it's in the context of the part of, of the laws of war. Even at war, if it could bring us a, a peaceful solution and conclusion to a war, you're not allowed to give up Israel, not even an inch. And we discussed in our introduction how it was that some, in certain cases, would allow it if the generals who are active duty, etc. So uh, we'll pick up from this next week as we follow Rambam and then continue back into conducting war. Actually, get beyond the Israel issue, conducting war. Thanks for being here and have a wonderful evening and Shabbat Shalom. Bye bye. Thank you.